So our last lightning talk is by Stephen Uzo from the New York Hall of Science, and he is leading our um, spoke planning project on data literacy. So I'm from the New York Hall of Science, um, which is in um, Corona, Queens, um, which is in this very diverse city, one of the most diverse boroughs. And um, I'm here to talk a little bit about how we're, our, our effort to try to bridge the gap between the data-driven science and technology practice and the public understanding of big data and big science. So first I'd like to provide a little context. Um, as all of you are aware, we live in an age in which traditional science, uh, in fact, every sector, every aspect of human culture even is flooded with data. Believe it or not, this transformation was preceded by a period of where the future of science was actually in doubt. Um, Derek DeSolo Price predicted the exponential growth of science would make research become so complex and costly would soon exhaust our ability to support science as an enterprise. That was at the sixth International Congress on the History of Science in 1950 when data was hard to find. So um, by the turn of the millennium, our ability to acquire, process, and store data had accelerated rapidly, largely due to advances in computer power, cheap and automated data capture systems for everything from DNA sequencing to remote sensing, and we're gathering data at such a rapid rate now that we're drowning in it. Science and engineering have been transformed, and we're now facing a kind of Moore's law of data-driven science, an exponential growth in what Jim Gray called the fourth paradigm. In an era in which computer users worldwide generate enough data to, in 15 minutes to fill the US Library of Congress, our ability to gather data has vastly outstripped our ability to analyze it. And the science and technology community are in a great hurry to catch up um, with such things as machine learning, neural computing, and new statistical techniques such as TDA, which is actually an old technique um, applied to a new problem. And the rest of human civilization is just along for the ride or more accurately um, left in the dust. And as the kinds of demands for everything from startups to Fortune 500 companies to research labs, um, have dramatically shifted away from a focus on individual compartmentalized skills to nimble, highly creative, collaborative, interdisciplinary, and analytical skills. The kinds of questions we ask ourselves, the degree of complexity of nature at all scales and complexity of the problems policymakers, the public, and industry is called upon to solve are increasingly interdisciplinary, complex, and data-driven. The routine, manual, and repetitive tasks are either completely automated or no longer relevant. And you can see from this graph that um, by 1990, uh, things started to very dramatically change in terms of the kinds of uh, things that were going on in the workplace, and unfortunately, very little happened in the field of education to follow that. So we have an opportunity to transform human knowledge along with big data, to bring the public along with us, which is not only the most ethically responsible thing to do, it's also the, the only way this process will continue at the rapid pace that it's going now. Without a big data knowledgeable public policy and education sectors, we're building ourselves a house of cards that will fall or be severely hampered purely through the lack of skills and intellectual prowess. This was the impetus for us to put a stake in the ground around big data literacy and start a process to build capacity that can scale throughout all data domains to close the gap between what goes on uh, in your guys' places and what happens uh, with the public outside. So this is the title of our project. Um, the goal of which is to articulate and propose a program of work that NSF would address, that, and to NSF that would address the gap and begin to a path toward big data literate society. Um, and remember, this is a planning grant. It starts with getting a sense of what kind of resources, educational programs, knowledge, and needs are out there now. Um, and in an ideal world, uh, we'd find many amazing resources and programs that would just need to be brought together in the right way with the public. Uh, and we'd already be cultivating a, a generation of data literate individuals that can pursue academic and work careers in big data and advance our work in ways we can just now barely imagine. But indications are that like, there are likely inadequate resources out there for the public understanding of big data, how it works, and what the effect is on their lives and the lives of the people around them and across the globe. And there do not appear to be adequate academic programs to support workforce development and alignment of skills and competencies our citizens need, will need in the technological and scientific workplace. To figure out if our intuitions are correct, we started a collaborative process 
by assembling an inquiry group from uh, some of whom are in this audience um, and other big data members to research and explicate the state of big data learning. Um, then we'll bring them together with a, a group of other experts in April to validate uh, conclusions um, and look at what, what we need to fill the gap between the sort of snapshot that we might gather um, um, looking at what's out there in the field and what kinds of things are happening in big data practice across all settings and domains of work. So collaborative inquiry is a kind of action research that starts by circumscribing the problem, in this case, defining the state of big data literacy, and taking, then taking action based on the initial proposition uh, to develop a snapshot of resources, programs, and projects that exist to support and understand big data across audiences and learning settings, then convene to debate the validity and significance of these results, and then reflect on the implications and impact on the original question to determine whether the process needs revision so this process will hopefully um, result in the what it takes part that we will propose to NSF for a large scale pro larger scale project. And assuming we get this um, uh, support for this project, and even if we don't, we'll be calling on all of you to participate in fostering improved understanding in an era of big data. So I just want to spend a little time um, going through some of our current work um, that relates to this. Um, we've actually had an interest going back about 15 years, and um, we've uh, been involved in a, a, a sort of a bigger initiative in the teaching and learning of the science of complex networks. So we actually did uh, what's probably the first museum exhibition on complex networks. Um, we hold routinely international conferences and workshops and symposia on networks, science, and education. Um, we, have, uh, we did a high school research program for disadvantaged teens. Um, and um, we also developed a set of agreed upon essential network literacy concepts, which is now translated into 19 languages. Um, we're also working on teacher training, and we're co-sponsoring our third um, teacher training workshop this summer uh, in collaboration with West Point and ARO. Uh, another um, area that we're working on is early and continued involvement in scientometrics and semantic web development. And over here, this is the this is a map of all the science from ISI and Web of Science. Um, it's um, millions of citation in, uh, from, from these indices that indicate a snapshot of what the state of science research is now. And you can compare these uh, in time slices. So this one's in 2004, but we can go back to like 1974 uh, because these, these, uh, that's how far back ISI database goes. Um, we've also done international workshops and magnet conferences, working with semantic web development and partnering with the development of traveling science mapping exhibitions, as well as research and data visualization and understanding. So we have some projects that we've done and um, have drawn some interesting conclusions, and we're still looking for support to continue that work. Um, we also do a series of workshops to study data literacy skills in very young children. We just got some ITES funding for that. Uh, Catherine is largely spearheading that work. Um, and these are five to eight-year-olds, so we're looking at data literacy, you know, sort of where, where it begins with kids, and we're doing some very interesting work in, in, that, in that area, which we'll be able to report on um, at some point in, in the near future. And um, also um, work uh, on developing exhibitions and outreach on data-driven sciences, including sustainability science, ocean and estuary science, and climate sciences, which are extremely difficult for people to, uh, to get their minds around because of the fact that there's this notion of, you know, um, our world is, is basically a day-to-day -day sort of um, stream of local uh, anecdotal um, things that we do from one thing to another, and that these data exist at very large spatial and temporal scales, and it's largely invisible to most people. So a lot of the problems that we see in terms of people's believability of science stem from the inability to, to become attached to those data. So we're studying those kinds of things and trying to develop public experience that surmount those problems. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to elaborate on, on any of these. We also put in a smart and connected communities proposal to do participatory research with, um, with our, our, uh, our community of need, which is Corona, which has 80% um, um, immigrant population. Um, oh, and also we held probably the, the, uh, the first big data um, public festival, which was in, in 2015, which Catherine organized. Um, so through this work, and um, we, we were going to propose to NSF our involvement 
and our involvement in the Big Data Hub, we hope to amplify these kinds of efforts uh, and uh, draw on additional partnerships and support and find ways to scale this work both uh, within the hub region and, and globally. Finally, I just want to thank uh, the support for this project under uh, NSF size um, and um, also the support of the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub. You guys are amazing. And also to thank all the members of the hub that are participating in this work. And, I, um, and we have this, our workshop coming up in April that hopefully after that we'll have a lot more to report on. Thanks. Um, could you just provide a little bit more context on the community connectivity and what effects that has had on the immigrant population? The community of? You mentioned the community connectivity and um, the fact that there is a large immigrant population. And so oh, our community, sorry, our community. Um, so we're in Corona, Queens, which is, um, it's, um, it's a very diverse as part of Queens. It's um, primarily uh, Spanish speaking, primarily South American um, from various countries. Um, some people call them all Hispanics as one group, but um, we have Mexicans, we have Venezuelans, we have Colombians. We have the, the largest Ecuadorian population outside of Ecuador. Um, and this is, this is kind of the group. The, one of the, the important characteristics of this group is that they are not, they're not only high need, but they're also high aspiration. These, uh, the, on report card day, every parent shows up. Every parent shows up for, at the school for report cards. So the, the, this community, the kids and the, and the, the, and the parents, it's a, a large numbers of families. Um, there are a lot of cultural institutions within the, within the, um, the, the community that are really important. The, um, uh, the biggest of which is actually the Catholic Church. They have uh, 10,000, Catherine, is 10,000 parishioners? 10,000 parishioners show up every, every weekend. They have, a, they have to run a lot of services to pack them into a church. So there are lots of communication channels we have with this community. We have initiatives to try to, uh, try to build out um, STEM education into community uh, organizations, including after school clubs. This Monday we launch the Science Ambassadors, right? We open our museum at 2 p.m. for everybody in the community for free, um, including after school help, um, and uh, sort of docent activities, workshops, and a parent university, which actually helps, um, help, helps parents unpack some of the kinds of learning that happens in informal spaces versus, um, versus um, school and how they, how they relate to one another. Um, so that's kind of that community. Our smart and connected communities pr proposal is actually to do a participatory design research project with our community members directly to design interfaces to uh, NYC Open Data, which showed up on a slide earlier, um, which is a vast amount of data that are, that are being uh, made available to the public, but nobody knows what to do with it. And particularly communities of need that are, that are in, a lot of, in a lot of ways detached from the kinds of, of, um, of capacities that um, wealthier communities have, um, particularly now when there's, they're shying away from um, um, official sort of, sort of presence because of, uh, the, of the risk of being deported. Um, if Corona was, if they deported every illegal alien in Corona, um, we would have empty streets. Does that answer your question or did I just dodge it? <laughs> um, you, you talked about uh, uh, your work in loss of public confidence in science. And somebody's termed this the death of expertise or the death of belief in expertise. Can you elaborate a little bit on what your institution is doing and, and maybe who you're working with on this very important area? So we're working with a, a lot of different people, but um, the, at, at its core is this idea that you, you're, what you're trying to teach people is something that they're not equipped to learn. Uh, in school, the notion of you know, data literacy is pretty foreign. Even statistics is, is badly represented. And the areas where these kinds, of, these kinds of things matter, particularly things like climate science and environmental science, it doesn't exist. The kind, you go through any environmental science textbook, you will, you'll see very little that relates to, to real meaningful um, explication of how uh, large-scale data and large-scale indicators actually are, are learnable. So we're kind of trying to deal with that head-on. We have exhibitions and programs that are intended to actually try to get people to understand big data 
um, the, the network science work that we do. Network science is actually a very uh, useful way into big data because it's about relationships. It's something that's very easy for people to get their mind around. You can see it. Um, it, it can be well visualized. And, um, and we find high school kids can do amazing things with those, with those data once they know how to use the tools. That's another barrier is knowing how to use the tools and getting teachers to know how to use the tools so that that, that can actually translate to, to classroom instruction is a whole other matter. So those are the kinds of areas that we're working in. We're partnering with, with Columbia and primarily the Lamont Doherty folks in, um, in, um, in developing ways into thinking about sustainability data. Um, we have a couple of projects with them um, and I invite anybody here to come out to the museum as my guest and we can, we can show you some of the work that we're doing.